as we call it in KZN, as we are in KZN, and they're over there as well. They say Mvelingangi. Now, for me, that tells me there was one individual, if not more, but who shared the same message. One source of the same message, hence spreading the message that there is one God and that God needs to be acknowledged. And as I did try to show, I will still, of course, go on uh, at a later session, show you other striking, even like as even architecture, because we know architecture has always been known to, to be very good in terms of uh, giving history and knowledge about the previous nations and people of the past and so on. So I will also try to exercise that and look into other traditions that are still either being kept or that are known of because some are no longer very much being kept by uh, our African uh, people, our African brothers and sisters. And I will also show what Islam has to offer us in this very same aspect. So I hope in a nutshell, I've just given you the similarities in the concept of God and some other values. And of course, I will still share a lot of other signs that I feel. These are the signs that Allah, God Almighty, Um Velingangi, did send his message. And this will be more like a testimony towards that and with the aid and the help that whoever is from one background thinking Islam is for a specific a group of people who speak a specific language, whether they, someone thinks Islam is sp specifically for Indian people or they feel specifically is for Arabs, this is the time I'm trying to show you that Islam is universal in the true sense of the word. So in essence, I want you to take it from me because I did actually witness it and I did look into it and I am grateful to share this information. Of course, I will come back with more in a short while. Thank you so much for tuning in. Actions speak louder than words. Pledge monthly towards Al-Quran. In it, there is no doubt. Al-Quran, no person should live without. The IPCI prints 5,000 copies continuously to the value of 600,000 rands. Your monthly contribution will maximize our distribution. Call now on 031-306-0026. It's the right thing to do. IPCI sets up global with the message of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings of God Almighty be upon you. Uh, welcome back to the second session of uh, African culture, uh, highlighting on Ubuntu, the relationship between Ubuntu and Islam. Um, as I did communicate earlier, fortunately, um, I will also share other aspects of what makes me feel confident to say that Islam is a revival of our true culture because we know there is like innovati innovations in everything, there's innovations and in this case even with culture some people innovated and hence some deviated because of their innovations but what I'm going to communicate and share with you is the purity of the true culture that God Almighty has given us and because of that I feel if you are someone who is uh, really looking forward to following the footsteps of your forefathers in the true sense of the word, in a sense that accordingly, with in line with what God had to sanction and give our forefathers, these are some of the things you can look into and be confident enough that Islam offers you that, which means that you do not need to go any further or any far than becoming Muslim and following according to the teachings of Islam, because that is what I am already trying to exercise and show you so that you can basically have grounds to say why you are happy to be Muslim and why you are happy to take this direction because I'm only trying to look into uh, where we come from so that we can then see the direction towards Islam so that it's much more easy and also hopefully to kill the misconception that Islam is for one group of people or one nation or one uh, language of people but rather a universal way of life. As I did mention earlier, the fact that knowledge uh, is very important in a sense that y you need to know where you are, you need to know where you're from so that you know where you're going. And there are different ways at which knowledge is being transmitted. And we know very well that 
uh, architecture is one of the subjects that actually has helped a number of archaeologists to study the anthro uh, it's called anthropology whereby they studied the ways of life of previous nations and it has always been very much easy for them to tell the kind of people lived in a certain region at a certain time through architecture so what i'd like to share and show you uh, is houses of worship we know very well that uh, faith and, and religion and uh, spirituality has always been uh, in line with certain specific places that are used for that, certain specific places that are built for that. If not, even our own abodes would be used as a place where we can always engage in our spiritual, uh, you know, um, spiritual values and spiritual practices. Now, in this very same sense, I looked at the concept of houses of worship. And strikingly, when we look throughout history, that our people, African people, especially, in, I would say, in the South Africa at large, because I know even in other places, we have these kind of sheikhs that are called kukastandas. They are sheikhs, they are like the dome, as y you can see. And you find that these were, co were called with the, the act of that is done, or the practice that is done within them. Like the term kukastandas means we are kneeling and praying. Now, once again, it's something that would be very striking for, for someone like myself, knowing that I've been there and I've heard this being mentioned. Now, when I look into Islam, I find that the mosque, or what is known as masjid, the mosque, where we go and pray as Muslims, it's called masjid, specifically called masjid. And we know that it comes from the term sajda or sujud, which, a, which means prostration. And we know prostration is in line with kneeling and placing our foreheads on the ground in worship and in reverence and services towards the supreme being, which is God Almighty Allah. Now, the mere fact that the names alone, they suffice for me to look into it more. Because on the other side, the sheikhs were called in a sense that they were named after the act that is being done within them, which is to kneel and pray. Now, no one would kneel and pray unless they are trying to communicate with the Supreme Being. Because, you know, prayer has always been uh, ascribed to communication and, uh, and, and spiritual engagement with the Supreme Being. So we saw that the sheikhs were called exactly like that, Guka standards. And on the other hand, Islam, with the places of worship, they are called masjid, which is exactly an act of worship that is being done by Muslims. Whenever they prostrate, that is called sujood, and the mosque from the root word sajada, you know, so it means that they prostrate uh, before God Almighty and so on, so that the house or the place of worship is even named after the act, which is exactly linguistically similar to the Zulu concept of the sheikhs that were built by uh, our ancestors and also what we find today as being a mosque. Now, why am I on about this? It's because I feel that even though we do not have a book that teaches us this, but it is not rocket science to see that the principle and the concept is the same throughout time. And Islam is the only way of life right now that has the exact similar terms for certain things that are in line and even the actions they're exactly the same as what would be what would be known uh, by our ancestors as values or tradition or culture and we find that masjid and kuka standards is exactly the same concept it's exactly the same thing and it comes from the same background of worshiping one god and for me that tells me this is a sign that God Almighty did send somebody to the Zulu nation, or at least to the nation, the Nguni nation, who speak a language which is now known as Isi Zulu and other languages, of course, not sidelining them because throughout time language develops and so on, but there would be a time where language was the same. And in, in that very same sense, that's where 
we know and that's where we can actually tell that these are people of the same nation and like also the aspect of how they would build their houses and how they would build their places of worship. Now here's another interesting aspect. In, in the shack where uh, presumably spiritual like ventures would be done or performed or rituals and rites would be performed and done. Within the place, inside there will be a place known as Umsamo, which is a sacred part of the structure or of the shack. Now this part is very, very important in a sense that you can't sit with your back against it. And I will tell you why I'm emphasizing on this. So much so that whenever there's any spirituality that needs to be involved from an African traditional perspective, this place would be the place where everyone would come and they will sit either facing it or they will sit adjacent to it so that they do not disrespect it. So it had principles of respect that needs to be shown in a sense that you would have to sit facing it or adjacent to it. That's one principle. The, the one principle or ruling that you would have is there will be a limitation of people who approach or go there or to do these rites. So in essence, if, if they are within the shack, but some people won't be allowed, like we know certain natural uh, dispositions that uh, some people in, in like, um, like especially if I, I may refer to the female gender, there are certain situations that would actually render them, you know, exempted from exercising certain rights. So in this case, that very same principle was there. The other principle would be the males will sit on the one end while the females will sit on the other end. It wasn't a mixed, uh, mixed uh, congregation whenever this would be taking place and so on. And this was the concept then. You come to Islam, the very same thing applies when it comes to facing the direction of Mecca, which is uh, uh, like our universal umsam or our universal sacred place, our Qibla, the direction we face. As in the shacks, in the, in the huts, the rather than shacks, sorry, uh, in the huts rather, I think that's the more appropriate term for these uh, buildings. In the huts, this principle was there. And it was known, and I believe some people would still testify to this fact, that it was a respected place, sacred place. And in Islam, the most sacred places in the world would be Mecca al mukarramah which is in Saudi Arabia, uh, which is the most sacred place that we face when we pray. And it is the same place that when we do certain uh, rituals like slaughtering and so on, we still have to face that direction. And in the huts, in the Zulu huts, the same thing was the case that you would have to, uh, your sacrificial animal would have to uh, be associated with this part or this sacred place one way or another, whether you bring it while you make your prayers and you bring it and present it before the place, before you can go and slaughter it and so on. Now, for me, really, I, I can't say it's a coincidence because it's too like apples for apples kind of a situation where this side exactly com is complemented by the Islamic side of it. Now, in a sense that you face the Qibla when you pray, you can't sit, you're not allowed, you are very, very much discouraged, even while you're in the masjid or in the mosque, to sit with your back against the direction of, uh, of the Qibla or the direction of Mecca. So much so that you either sit facing Mecca or you sit adjacent to the direction of Mecca and also other things that you'd have to assume the very same position. Now, of course, Mecca is a universal umsamo, if I may put it like that, and this is the beauty of Islam because it does no longer make it a principle for a certain individual or n indigenous people or nationalities, but for the entire humankind. They are all united in this. And I will still share some very interesting facts unto this matter so that I can keep on emphasizing and pounding on this very same point, that Islam is not a new culture. 
It's not a different culture, but rather Islam is a purifier of all the various cultures so that they are pure and they are in line with what God Almighty had sanctioned through his prophets, peace be upon them, as he sent them to various nations and tribes as the Quran does exercise that kind of an understanding and background. Now, I will come to another. Honestly, uh, by now I feel even whatever I've shared should suffice for you to see that this is a matter that you can look into wi with a more broader eye and open mind because these can be coincidences as they keep on appearing and appearing and appearing. We look at mountain prayers. In the Zulu or in the African tradition, mountain prayers, even Christian faith, there are some churches and denominations that still keep into this because they know, even biblically, it's there, that there would be prayers that are done on a mountain, either a specific mountain or a mountain that, that would be uh, convenient for the people at the time. So we know from uh, the African background that even our ancestors, they used to do the same thing. There would be times when there's a lot of drought, and we know in Islam there's a prayer for that, which is called Salatul Istisqa, which is a prayer for rain. So their own way of doing that would be going to a mountain and they would bring maybe some sacrificial animal, which will be, could be a sheep or a goat or even a chicken, and they would go there with the soul intention of asking God Almighty to send an angel they would call that being or the angel they would call because we know now that it was an angel um, they had a name for it so they would go on, on the hilltop or on the mountain and make these prayers and ask God Almighty to send rains by dictating upon this creature of his or in specifically this angel of his to actually send and bring down rains. And it would definitely be the case that before they leave there, it's already raining. Now, the quick response would be seen by them so much so that they will, by the time they reach their abiding places or their abodes, their homes, they'd be like wet to the feet because they prayed a sincere prayer and they prayed a prayer that is so striking that it end its response as immediate as possible. Now, which means that this was probably taught, as I would show you how do I feel, this was probably taught by some messenger or prophet of God. So while on that, they prayed and they would so much so that it will rain until they would feel that they have to go back again on the mountain and ask God Almighty to like to thank him and say the rain is enough because of the fear of them losing their crops through uh, erosion and, and, and flooding or so, so that they do not lose their crops because the rain will be so much and abundant that they would have to go back again and ask that the rains be like uh, like reduced or the rains to stop raining because it, ha it, it has been sufficient for them. Now coming to the Islamic side. In Islam, we know among the things we do when we visit the most sacred places, which is Mecca, um, we have a time or a day at which while we are paying homage to these uh, 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 holy places, where we go on a, a mountain known as Mount Mina. And we know very well from the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that whatever prayer that is being made, whatever supplication that is done while the person or the servant of God is standing on, on, on the